Okay, first things first, I know that I owe you guys a video. Um, I'm really sorry. Thankfully, my life is extremely busy and I'm very blessed to have a lot going on. And what that means is that every now and then I'm not able to crank out uh, a YouTube slash Facebook video um, every single week. Uh, a lot of you guys know, and I'm going to go ahead and like announce it if nobody doesn't, uh, my wife's about seven and some change months pregnant, so our lives are pretty wild right now, and our, everything's going great, but um, we got a lot of baby showers going, and we got a lot of nursery painting going on, and this is our first one, so uh, it's a whirlwind, and I'm not going to even pretend like it's not going to be even crazier here in about another month and a half, two months, uh, for the next 18 years or more. Um, so just bear with me and uh, I'm going to crank out some what I think is really good content for you guys to know about um, your EFI, about your turbo systems, about your superchargers, your nitrous. Definitely need to do a nitrous video. Uh, all that said, let's get this one going. So I see a lot of guys struggle with their EFI uh, on their first installs. Uh, I see them struggle with these problems that they never quite ever sort out. It's just something that they deal with. Um, talking to that point, if you're dealing with a problem, that's something that you should have to do with a carburetor. You should not have to deal with a stumble. You should not have to deal with uh, cold starts being bad. You shouldn't have to deal with anything with your EFI. You should be able to walk outside in fringe setups. I can make them some accessions, but you should be able to walk outside in 20 degree weather outside and be able to turn the key on your car and it fire right up and take off and, and, and run just fine. And I know that somebody's gonna hold me to that now and challenge accepted, it, it can be done. We can make it happen. That said, here are some things that you need to know about EFI in general. And what you need to know about all of your systems, Holly stuff included, uh, all of Holly's systems, your factory EFI has some of these problems as well. Um, your factory EFI is probably a little more robust to run in situations where uh, you have sensor failures. Um, things like, I know a lot of guys have O2 sensor failures um, that can drive them crazy. And I'm going to talk about that and explain a little bit about how that works and um, kind of why you run into situations with Holly that you wouldn't otherwise run into with uh, with the, your factory style EFI. But this also applies to, to other aftermarket EFI systems, um, you know, Mega Squirt, Micro Squirt. Um, I think FI Tech is one of them. Uh, I, I stick to the, to the Holly stuff most of the time, but uh, EFI in general is gonna have some, some issues. And the first thing here, bad data in, bad data out. I know everybody's probably heard that saying at some point uh, in regards to computers. Well, guess what? EFI has an onboard computer. That's what it is. It simply takes sensor data in and makes decisions on what it's gonna do for fuel and spark based on that sensor data in. And so if you're feeding it a bad number, if you're feeding it bad data, you're gonna get a result that you don't want. So it's really important that we upfront understand uh, what it is we're, we're expecting to see on the input side. And I often say this to, to my friends, to people uh, around that um, to be a good tuner, it doesn't mean that you're necessarily good with a computer. It means that you know what the engine wants and you can at least interpret the data well enough to know whether that data is real. Um, being able to look at a, a data log and see that an AFR signal is clearly false and is wrong will often, you know, set you above someone else or, or set you out from someone else being able to identify that problem. And you a lot of times can get a guy running in, in way shorter period of time than just throwing sensors at it or throwing changes at it um, just for the sake of trying to make something happen. So. We'll talk more about that. Um, the thing you, you need to know about fuel injection versus carburation. Um, carburation is something that happens that is related to air speed. So when you pull air through a Venturi, 
uh, you guys can Google Venturi effect or what a, what a Venturi is, but um, basically air across a small orifice is actually based on speed, pulling a metered amount of fuel into the engine. It, it's created, it creates a pressure differential from the fuel bowl to the actual barrel of your carburetor and your jet size is what actually affects how much fuel goes in for a given airspeed. It's really important you understand that um, carburation happens based on speed and injection a lot of times, not in every case, but a lot of times in the, in the standard setups that, that most of us are running is happening based on pressure change. Um, I know everybody's probably seen uh, MAP sensor, MAP, uh, a lot of times on your, your Holly stuff, it's represented in KPA unless you guys are using turbos and you can set it up to be represented in, in terms of boost. Um, boost is in terms of PSI. Um, so the thing you gotta know about uh, that difference is, let's say that we tune up our carburetor and we're gonna go and drive to uh, the top of a mountain. As you increase your elevation, your air density becomes lower. And the reason that that is important is because for the same given airspeed, you're getting the same volume of air in, but the density is now lower, which means that you're actually getting less air into the engine. When that happens, your engine sees, the, or excuse me, your carburetor sees the same speed and therefore dumps the same amount of fuel, but since you have less air, you're now rich. The higher you go in elevation without making carburetor changes is gonna actually cause your carburetor to make your engine more rich. Uh, typically, that's not a problem until you get to the point where the thing just flat out won't even run because it's so rich. And that's pretty, that's pretty far. Um, you're not, if, if, you're, if you're seeing that much elevation change, call me because like, I really wanna know where you're driving this thing. However, that said, your fuel mileage gets really bad if you're, if you're up in elevation. And, Nobody wants horrible fuel mileage, not to mention you can foul plugs and there, there's problems that, that come with, with changing elevation. Well, the same problem happens with your inject, injection system, your EFI, it's just it happens the opposite way. So what we're seeing in terms of uh, air pressure, because the, the pressure is now lower as we go up in elevation, the density is lower, uh, what happens is instead of seeing a hundred kPa that we would see at sea level um, at wide open throttle, now when we go to like my Colorado guys will get this. If we go to Colorado and go on, you know, a, a mile up, what you run into is you might only see 75 kPa of manifold pressure. And when that happens, if you don't have an O2 sensor that's correcting for you, or if you don't have a Barrow sensor that's correcting for you. Um, now you're you're not seeing uh, the same pressure at the same throttle angle, and now your engine is going to run lean. Uh, the way that Holly handles this is by using the O2 sensor. So it's really important that you actually have a working O2 sensor because Holly does not make barometric uh, pressure corrections on the fly. Uh, if we had a simple equation to set up a fuel offset based on Barrow, which is really easy to do in an advanced table. Then we could get completely around this this problem and you could theoretically i don't recommend this you could unplug your two sensor and drive wherever you want to go so just keep that kind of thing in mind that's the biggest difference between injection and carburation obviously with injection we either can or can not have a distributor um, sometimes we do have a distributor sometimes we don't sometimes we have coil packs that's kind of uh, outside the scope of the video but uh, just keep in mind that that's the biggest difference between injection and carburation is how we actually meter the fuel the next thing is grounds. Holy cow, I think I made a, a quick video to, to harp on grounds. Um, grounds are everything when it comes to your fuel injection. And the reason I say that is because um, you're in, uh, especially in the case of, of like your Terminator X, your Holly stuff, um, your coil pack ground is going to dictate whether or not you actually have a charged coil. If you don't have a charged coil, you can't fire a coil, which means you can't fire a plug, which means you can't fire a cylinder. Uh, that's really, really, really important. Your, your coil pack grounds are also your injector grounds. So if we've got a bad injector ground, that's like the scariest possible scenario because we've, now we've got an injector that doesn't want to open. And when it does open, it only opens a little bit. And then it only puts in a small amount of fuel. 
and now your your uh, closed loop correction is going to drive through the roof and that's assuming that the ground is correct on your your AFR sensor your O2 sensor there's all sorts of problems because grounds the thing you have to remember about uh, in a 12 volt system 12 volts versus ground is um, it's often referred to in the systems world as either high or low and uh, if you don't have a ground, you can't pull a high signal low. If you're giving something 12 volts and it's got a horrible ground, when you go to ground that thing, let's say it only gets down to 5 volts on your on your reference. Now, it doesn't work. Probably switches at 3.5 volts. So, uh, in terms of your, your uh, crank position sensor and your cam position sensor, I, I know a lot of you guys like to switch between 24X and 58X and all that stuff. Um, I had a case recently where I helped a guy figure out uh, that his uh, crank sensor and cam sensor ground wire had been unplugged and the way that we found that was we saw that we were getting 12 volts across the sensor but on the ground side he was still seeing 10 volts and the reason that that happened was because his ground wire had been pulled out of the harness um, whether it was a holly problem or an installation problem I don't know it doesn't matter my point is your grounds are everything that your grounds are a reference to tell the ECU and all of the all of the sensors that are coming back to the ECU what their actual voltage is. You can take a five volt sensor that say is um, negative 40 to 250 degrees F, zero to five volts, and if you have a bad ground on that sensor, it might push it a volt, right? So if we're at zero volts at, or excuse me, if we're at um, zero degrees F at one volt, and we're at 80 degrees F at two volts, and we have a bad ground, and it pushes that sensor, uh, you know, up a volt. Now we're going to be reading 80 F whenever it's actually truly zero F. Um, that particular case is not an engine melter. Um, what is an engine melter potentially is whenever we've got an, an O2 sensor that's not well grounded and it's going to pull out a bunch of fuel because it sees uh, the wrong data. Uh, what is potentially an engine melter is, uh, let's say you're making a boatload of boost. Let's say you're making 35 pounds of boost and you're running some form of high octane gasoline that uh, at really elevated uh, manifold air temperatures uh, at manifold air temperatures really elevated temperatures you need to pull some timing out because um, you're gonna knock it, it, it can't happen if you are off by a volt that might be the difference between pulling timing and not uh, I had a situation one time where uh, it was just the opposite we were pulling timing we were pulling five degrees of timing because the sensor was pegged um, and it was bad data and, and we could have made 50 more horsepower or something crazy uh, if it wasn't pulling all this timing out. So anyway, just that's enough on that. Grounds matter, grounds are everything. When you go to put your Holly systems in, make sure that your cylinder head grounds not only are clean and not only are tight, but that they are extra clean and extra tight. And it's, in some cases, I've even had a customer that had to run a dedicated ground wire from the back of his cylinder head that shared the same terminal as his coil pack grounds to the battery to give that thing sufficient ground. Even though he had the engine block grounded, guys, steel is not a good conductor. It is sheet metal, it's a horrible conductor. The frame rail is not a good conductor. Run the copper, just, just run the copper. It doesn't have to be a lot of copper, it just needs to have like a good copper ground. All right, enough of that, let's talk about Terminator X. Terminator X, I see a lot of guys confuse their inputs and outputs and what inputs do and what outputs do and how we're going to use that stuff in order to make the, the ECU function the way we want it to. The thing that you need to remember about your inputs and outputs is that inputs are reserved for if you want to tell the ECU something. If you want to make a change based on something happening external to the ECU, you have to tell it about it. And that's what your inputs are for. Uh, inputs are things like momentary buttons uh, or switches on your clutch for like a two-step. It's your trans brake input, it's your bump input, uh, it's your flex fuel sensor input. Um, it's really anything that you want it to be uh, as long as it's 12 volt or 5 volt or uh, it can be a ground input uh, or it can be a frequency input. can't remember them all off the top of my head. It's in your software. Just take a look. 
the point of this is if you need to tell the ECU something, if you want it to know what the temperature of your transmission is, if you want it to know uh, how much fuel you've got in the tank, I don't know why you do that with a Holley ECU and not the dash, but if you want to do that, you can absolutely do that. That's no problem. Um, outputs, on the other hand, are if you want the ECU to do something for you. And sometimes our outputs are based on our inputs. Uh, and a, again, a good example of that is a clutch switch or push button for a rev limiter or a trans brake or a pump. When you hit the trans brake input, it's going to function an output that will then control your trans brake using a, a relay. If you hit the bump button, that's gonna give an input to the ECU that then is gonna control that trans brake output to pulse your trans brake so that you can walk the car into the beams. If you trip a clutch switch to set a rev limiter, then the ECU is now going to not use an output. It doesn't have to use an output to, to run a rev limiter. It's just going to use the internal uh, ECU functions to cut spark or throttle body or fuel, depending on how you have it set, to run a rev limiter for you. Um, another place that we're going to use outputs in a lot of cases that don't require an input is uh, your, your MAC valve for your turbo stuff. So uh, we can set up an advanced table or an output table or run the, the Holly, the canned uh, boost control to run a MAC valve that is going to use an output. And in the case of Terminator X, and this is one note that we need to make, outputs on Terminator X are always ground, whether they're pulse width modulated or if they're always on they're always gonna be ground. Um, your HPs and your dominators can do a 12 volt output. Terminator X cannot. It, that changes your wiring a little bit, but it really isn't the end of the world. Um, you don't always, I haven't run into a case yet where I couldn't change some things around to make that work. It's also important to note that your inputs on Terminator X can be more than just grounds. I think I covered that earlier. Um, but a MAC valve, is going to be pulse width modulated, ground, keyed 12 volt to one side, output to the other, and we can control it with the Holly. And we can make decisions based on sensors that are already in place, um, you know, from the Holly Bay. For instance, how much boost we're making, uh, coolant temp, RPM is a good one, throttle position sensor. Um, a lot of my, if you guys have my, my, um, boost control stuff you'll see when I when we run a, a single three port a lot of times what I like to do is a uh, a closed or excuse me an open loop um, just an output table for your Mac valve and I always put in uh, a, a percent drop taper it down to zero at about 60 or 70 percent throttle so that you've got some TPS modulation um, it's very possible that if you just made it across the board over 70% TPS, 50% um, on the MAC valve, that say you want to pedal it a little bit, but not all of it, if you just start to kind of roll out of the throttle to not kill yourself in a burnout, um, it's very possible for a boost engine to make the exact same amount of power and the exact same amount of boost at 80% throttle as it is 100% throttle. Um, that's, that's no problem at all. Boost will push air right past that throttle body that's slightly closed. Um, so I always kind of make that modulation where uh, it kind of acts like an NA motor. Not totally. You got to have some reason about it. But that's that's what that's for. If you guys are looking at my tables, uh, this one I get all the time. Do I need two O2 sensors? What Terminator X is for is your. I hope I don't step on any toes. It's for your basic entry level EFI in a car that either wasn't carbureted or was carbureted before and didn't have EFI, or uh, you want to have more control but basic control over your later model stuff. I see a lot of F body guys putting Terminator X's in. I've been kicking around the idea of putting Terminator X in my, in my Corvette. Uh, a lot of pickup trucks have piggyback Terminator X's. They're awesome for that, they're, they're great. You can keep all your dash functions, you can keep everything else going on and just actually have a great control over your engine in real time, live, without having to whip out HP tuners and then you gotta shut the truck off and 
uh, then it takes 40 seconds to flash it, and then that change that you made didn't actually do what you wanted it to do because the factory ECU is extremely cumbersome to work with, and you got to lie to it six different ways to get it to do what you want it to do. When you can just tell the Holly, I want to idle at 14 to 1. I want to idle at, at 14 to 1 and AFR, and I don't want to have to like force it into open loop to, to do that. So that's one nice thing that's great about Terminator X. But back to the question, no, you don't need 202 sensors. If it's a hardcore race engine, if we're talking about NASCAR and, and drag, like competitive drag racing, uh, professional drag racing, if we're talking about our professional race engines that the engine itself costs more than a house, then yeah, you kind of want like 802s, or in the case of a V8, or in a V6, you want 602s. If it's a V12, you're gonna wanna put like all the O2s in it so that you can monitor each cylinder, and ultimately, if you want to know the truth, you end up making more power that way because you can manage your cylinder-to-cylinder -cylinder distribution better. That said, in the case of your LS Terminator X swap, no, you don't need 202s. You need 102. Uh, 202s is nice. You can do bank offsets, but what I'm going to tell you is, to be completely honest, the difference between an engine offset and a bank offset is not that much. If you have four cylinders, if you have four cylinders on a bank, in a 90 degree V8 and four cylinders are richer or leaner than the other four cylinders, first off, you got a problem because they're not, it's not like we're, we're dancing 180 out one side to, to the other side. There's a lot of crosstalk going on inside of your manifold and you need to figure out why one of those, and I'm talking about like large portions too. I'm not talking about one or 2%. Uh, I'm talking about guys that have got 20% bank offsets, 25% bank offsets. That means that basically you got a bank that's not firing. Like I've had that situation before. Um, the, the situation presented itself um, recently whenever the guy I mentioned before had to run a dedicated ground. He had everything wired correctly, but he had to run an additional ground to the battery. And that thing read crazy bank offsets. And you could look at the header collector and see one side was silly fat and then the other side looked like it was fresh and clean and never fired. That's a problem. In the case of your typical LS that's got equal length runners and one O2 sensor, it's fine. It's totally fine. The only time that I use the individual fuel trims uh, with the Terminator X is on the nitrous car when we're looking at individual plugs and we have just done a plug check after a pass, killed the motor, and we're looking everything over, then I'll do some small changes, individual trims, and that is on individual cylinders, not a bank offset. You don't need to do bank offsets. One sensor is fine if you're really worried about it. Put the sensor in one side, run the engine for two weeks, three weeks, a month, however long you feel like, and then just take the sensor. You got, you got a long enough lead, trust me, Holly does this right. Move the sensor to the other bank and look at your fuel trims, and if you're seeing a 3% lean condition on one bank globally and over a long period of time and over your entire fuel map, then absolutely by all means you can add 3% to the table and you're going to end up averaging that back out over 1.5%. You get what I'm getting at. We're splitting hairs. You don't need to worry about that. 3% of fuel is not a major power difference and it's not the difference between blowing something up and, and not if you have your AFR correctly set whenever you are picking your targets. It's a different video, or you can just come to me and I'll hook you up. So, that said, do I really need a tuner, right? Because Holly sold me the system and they said, well, it's self-tuning and all I have to do is answer a couple questions and now it's gonna run good. Uh, the Wizard Tune, in my opinion, and yes, I'm biased, is great to start the car. It's great to fire it up. It's great to like make sure that all the fluids are good. It's good for guys like me who are gonna tune your stuff. It's great for you to fire it up on the Wizard and make sure that everything is working correctly. Um, will it drive, drive down the road? Absolutely. It will run and it will drive. Um, what I'm gonna tell you is that if you have a boost application, that's dangerous with the wizard tune. I'm sorry, but I've seen that thing make some horrible decisions. Um, and it's again, bad data in, bad data out. If you don't answer the questions correctly for the wizard, the wizard's gonna make bad decisions. 
Um, I love you guys, but some of you make bad, some of you give it bad data. Like I've seen some stuff, it's pretty awesome. Um, lying to it about the injector size to get it to run right is not a good idea. That's that there, if there's something else going on, you need to figure out what that is because there's a lot of background math that you don't even see that goes into delivering the correct amount of fuel. Um, putting in, and I'm not, I'm not talking about picking an in injector that's very near your current in injector to get the thing started. I'm talking about increasing the uh, commanded injector size by 50% because the thing's rich. That's, that's not, don't, don't do that. That's, that's a bad, bad path to go down. Call me on that one. PM me, message me, do whatever you gotta do. Let's, let's talk about that before you go making, putting bad data into your ECU. Uh, the timing table from the wizard is atrocious. Uh, it often leaves a ton on the table in regards to idle quality. It leaves a ton on the table in regards to fuel mileage. And depending on how you set it up, can leave a ton on the table in regards to your, um, your peak power timing and or could blow your stuff up if you pick the wrong number. Um, if you put small block Chevy timing in an LS and then go run a bunch of boost on it, it's probably not gonna work out too good. Uh, I've also had guys that, that, quite frankly, they just don't know, and that's not their fault, um, but that's why I'm here. And we had a guy running eight degrees of timing in his entire timing table, and uh, the, the thing's just flat out not gonna run good. I don't care what it is, it's gonna run horrible, you're gonna get horrible gas mileage, it's not gonna to wanna to idle, and it's gonna make absolutely no power, if not melt your exhaust valves. Just call me on that one. Um, the thing that Holly does well, as we know, Holly is known for their wonderful closed loop correction. Holly will learn your fuel. It's self, it's not self-tuning, it's self-learning in terms of correcting for fuel uh, based on your O2 sensor. But again, what do we know about the first thing I started with? Bad data in, bad data out. If you start your Holly Terminator X setup um, for the first time on a Wizard Tune with an open header collector, you are going to get horrible corrections, so much to the point that increasingly every time you fire the thing up and let it run, you will eventually get to the point where it will not run. It will shut itself off because it is so rich and then it will not start back because all the plugs are fouled. Um, it happens. The other thing that you need to know about the Wizard Tune is it's extremely, um, I don't want to call it, safe's not the right word. It's extremely resilient in terms of, it's usually very rich to start with. The VE tables are very rich. The cranking fuel is very rich. The after start enrichment is very rich. Everything about them is typically fairly rich because a lack of fuel means you don't get any kind of pop or bang or anything when you go to start it. And if you got too much fuel, it might have to chew some fuel, but it more than likely will start. That said, if you keep, I've run into this, if you start your um, untuned Termex a couple of times back to back, when it's cold, like say you start it up and you got a water leak, okay, we gotta shut it off. And then you, you start it up and uh, I got a plug wire that's that's off and I gotta shut it off. And then you start it up one more time and uh, the transmission's leaking. Okay, well if you keep doing that over and over again, what you'll find is eventually about the fourth time, fifth time you go to start it, it's not gonna wanna start good. And then the sixth or seventh time you go to start it, it's just flat out not gonna start. And the reason is because it's so unbelievably rich before the O2 sensor has a chance to take over and you'll end up flooding the thing and, and foul the plugs. So just keep that stuff in mind on your wizard tunes. Um, I would much prefer as a tuner to help you out from the get go. Before, you're, before your system can learn bad habits, before you get a bad taste in your mouth, before, before you end up with um, a preconceived notion that EFI sucks. I would love to take a shot at your tune for you. Um, because a lot of times the wizard is a great way to make something start once maybe. Um, but I can make you a, a custom tune. That's not a wizard tune. It's not a canned solution. It's 
I've been there, I've done that, I've seen it. I've got a VE table to put in for that cam that you just told me you have. I've got uh, a car that I've already tuned somewhere that's got the same injector that you have and I know exactly how to get around making that injector idle great. There's all sorts of stuff that I can put in that, that tune and build you a, whatever you wanna call it. Um, it's a custom tune for you, for your car, for your application. We can go ahead and handle all of your inputs all of your outputs. We can do all the math. I've got a spreadsheet that I made that calculates exactly what your shift RPMs need to be for your transmissions. We can do all that stuff right up front and just completely skip all the BS of it's going to run bad and then I got to fix it. And then it's going to run good and then something else is going to go wrong and then I got to fix it. And then we're going to get that fixed and it's still just flat out. It we just won't start cold and I got to give it throttle pedal. No, we can fix that. Trust me. We can fix that. So, Anyway, that turned into a that turned into a, a self promotion that I didn't really want it to. However, we've made it through the list, so I'm gonna go ahead and cut it off because pretty much all of my videos I figured out turned into me just rambling at a camera. So, that said, appreciate your time. If you made it this far in the video, you get like an Air Five, and I will try to keep cranking out more videos and. Leave me some comments on what you want to hear about. I know I owe some guys a boost video. Quick disclaimer, I did make the uh, the boost video, but my lighting was awful, and I just don't have the heart to post that. I can't can't bring myself to do it. Uh, i got to remake it. Uh, and I did one on timing as well that, uh, of course, the camera shut off while I was doing it. So, all that said, catch you next time.